Welcome to Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. This is our weekly program featuring everything that is coming up in the area's music, arts, and entertainment scene. We will interview local artists, authors, musicians, and even some nationally recognized names who may be performing here in our area. We will have movie reviews and film suggestions from the real dad, Mark Schumann, and etiquette tips from Catherine Michaels. This is your all-access pass, and here are your hosts. Arts and Leisure editor Sally Sanders and our entertainment reporter Steve Coulter. And good afternoon. This is Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. I'm Sally Sanders. I'm missing my college colleague Steve Coulter this week who's off on vacation but I'm happy to have Mark Schumann hey there. Hey on there. the couch. Um, this is a busy season of weddings and yes, festivals and, and things. And who has a wedding coming up? And uh, I'm in the mood for weddings because yes. I have one this weekend. My younger son Mike yeah. is getting See? married. See, it's just it's perfect. The, the the trees are in bloom and it's warm. It's a beautiful time for a wedding. We'll hope for beautiful weather. Although isn't the the tradition that if it rains during a wedding that's good luck? I think that's uh, elections. I'm not sure. Well, but anyway. <laughs> but in the movies it rarely rains. At the sun weddings. is always it's, shining. The sun is always shining and inspired by your family event. We decided to take a look at weddings this week at yeah. the movies. There are a lot. There are it's, a lot. When you start thinking about it, it, it they just keep popping out of the woodwork. Well, and, and they kind of come in a couple of categories. There are movies that are all about weddings. Mm. And then there are movies with wonderful wedding sequences that add to the color of the film. So there's two kinds. Yeah. One of my favorites all about weddings is Monsoon Wedding. Oh. Which beautiful really movie. captures the whole oh, family feeling. Be beautiful, beautiful. It, it captures because you know weddings are, are wonderful occasions. They can be intense. Stressful. There is so much anticipation, and then it's it, it's over. Yeah, it, it, it's over. And so the the idea that all of these different dynamics occur in a very contained time frame is part of what makes movies about weddings so much fun. And monsoon wedding. Partly because it explores a different culture. Partly because it is so beautiful with all that the color. color yes. And it makes you so hungry because all that food. <laughs> but most of all, it reminds us that, that no matter the stress of the event, what, me what means so much at a wedding are the chances to connect with family and friends and celebrate new beginnings and all of that. All of that. I, I love, what a great choice. Yeah. What a great choice. I have to say my favorite that I watch several times a year is Four Weddings and a Funeral. Yeah. Uh, partly because I, I just love that brand of British humor. Partly because it's, a, it's the first time that he, we kind of discovered Hugh Grant. When he was fresh. Yeah. Yes. And partly because I keep wishing that that movie could have been made in a way where Audrey Hepburn could have played the role played by Andy McDowell. <laughs> and every time I watch it, I keep hoping that some miracle will occur. I'm not a big Andy McDowell no, fan, and I, I think she's she, the weak link. You but, think so? Yeah. But it's such a delightful film, and it's so touching and real and warm. And and, and I love the beginning. The beginning oh. is just like the best. Yeah, I, I I think I was the best man like. 13 or 14 times. Oh, sort of like 27 uh, dresses. And I just kept being the best man, and I had every nightmare that the best man goes through. I will forget the ring. I will forget this. I'll forget to go. Things like that 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 movie kind of brings to life. Yeah. So yeah. What, are some, what are some of your favorite wedding sequences in movies? Wedding sequences? Well, yeah. of course, The Godfather. Mm, that's beautiful. That's just a, I mean, that, that whole afternoon of, of wedding celebration and, and all the other things that were going on. Yeah, it, it, with that, again, it really celebrates family. It, yeah. it helps us see into a tradition that some of us may not get the chance to experience firsthand. The same way I feel about the wedding sequence in Fiddler on the Roof. Mm -hmm. When you, again, get to see a different approach to a wedding, you get to have that great bottle dance and bring together the, the family at the end of the first act. I love that I love that wedding sequence. I think one of my favorites, and it's not one that maybe you think of when you think of this movie, is The Wedding in Steel Magnolias. Oh, yeah. A, a lovely movie that's on television about once a week. But, <laughs> but it, for anyone who's lived in the South, that movie perfectly captures small town Southern living. And when they're in that wedding, in that church, 
with the overdone flowers, the overdone music, and they sing Oh Promise Me. And, and the poofy dresses and the big oh, hair. It's, and just, the, yeah. it's, just, it's just wonderful. It, when I was thinking about weddings and wedding films, it, it occurred to me that Julia Roberts is, is the queen she is of the queen. wedding she movies. She is the queen. She Starting the queen. with Mystic Pizza, which mm -hmm. was a wonderful... Oh. And sort of presaging Runaway Bride. <laughs> yeah, and the Runaway Bride. You know, it's funny when it when it was made, people criticized it because they thought it was kind of formula. Yeah. Uh, you know, but she and Richard Gere have such a natural chemistry. They do. Yeah. And if you recall, it was kind of at a period in her life when she played the Runaway Bride in real life, and and I think left. Who, who was it? Kiefer Sutherland at the at the was altar. Was it? Was it? Yeah. And and all of a sudden was kind of truth and fiction. And then, mm -hmm. of course, the great comeback picture of Julia Roberts' career is My Best Friend's Wedding, which is so much fun. Yeah. The, the movie In Search of an Ending, I sometimes call it. But it's, <laughs> it's just so much fun. And they have that great scene where the families get together and they break spontaneously into singing I Say a Little Prayer for You. I think one of my favorite wedding sequences has to be in The Sound of Music when we see that, that wonderful, I mean, it's just a very short segment where you know, she's in this beautiful dress and they're in that beautiful church in, in Austria and the nuns start singing magically during the, during the procession. Of course they would. Yeah. You know, that's a lot of fun. I had forgotten that one, that's a beauty. No, it, it's wonderful. Then there's, then there's Mamma Mia, yeah. which is all about a wedding and finally does include the wedding, but it's not quite the wedding that everyone had expected. Yeah. But it certainly is a lot of fun and the ultimate destination wedding. And speaking of ABBA, Muriel's wedding. Oh, <laughs> I, love, oh I love Muriel's wedding. That's Tony Collette oh. and Rachel Griffiths before they were names. Anyone, yeah. anyone, anyone. But it, and it, again, th these experiences in our lives bring out the best in people and they bring out the worst in people. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one about uh, that kind of family dynamic. Rachel, Rachel getting married. Rachel Rachel's getting married. Getting married with, yeah. With um, Anne Hathaway, one of I think her best performance. She was so true. Oh, so true, and didn't have any of that shtick that she sometimes brings yeah. to her movies. Yeah. But again, they bring out the best and the worst in in families. You think about my big fat Greek wedding, mm -hmm. and that reminds us how. We families love each other, but everybody wants the best from this moment. And as a result of wanting the best, sometimes they bring the worst in themselves. Well, having worked at a newspaper for a long, long time, I can tell you that <laughs> I've, I've seen the best and worst of, of brides and their families because everything has to be perfect. I mean, you, you encounter people be perfect. who believe, truly believe that this is the most important day it of the rest of It is the most of, important day. It, it is. It is not, and I, ho I hope that <laughs> it is. It no is. one believes this. <laughs> okay, so you need to go back and you need to watch the original, not the remake, but the original Father of the Bride. Spencer with Tracy. Spencer Tracy. Yeah. It's just a fabulous movie, and there should be a law against remaking fabulous movies. But when he has that nightmare about everything that goes wrong at the wedding, and you realize that even when things do go wrong, it's still the most wonderful day, even if it rains. We were at a wedding a few years ago, and it rained and rained and rained, and finally there was like a five-minute break, and they said, let's all go out and get married and then come back inside. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine, because what well, matters is the tradition. Well, that's going with the flow. It that's, is going with the flow. That's not expecting no, that everything no. is going to be absolutely no. perfect. I'm getting a little philosophical here. Because well, I I'm think, but I think it is weekend. philosophical. I think that, you know, I think it's wonderful when you think about what weddings can be and, and then what they should be. I think about the, the Jane Fonda comeback film, Monster in Law, where mm -hmm. she was, you know, I loved this later career of Jane Fonda because she just- Was that with Jennifer Lopez? Jennifer yeah. Lopez, it wasn't expected to be much of a film. Yeah. And it's actually kind of endearing. And Jane Fonda, of course, can make anything work, but she plays kind of this, this mother-in-law from another planet, kind of like Sweet Home Alabama. Mm -hmm. They did the same thing, kind of playing with it. Think about the, the Sandra Bullock film, The Proposal. Yeah. Which has a great wedding sequence in Betty White. All a movie <laughs> needs is Betty White. And then there's a, there's, a, there's a very odd Robert Altman film from many years ago. A wedding. Called A Wedding. A Wedding, yes. And, and you know, those Robert Altman films were, were kind of unusual collections of characters and actors. And 
kind of got this impression he shot a lot of stuff and then figured out how it would connect. And this one didn't necessarily connect completely with success, but it has that wonderful performance by Carol Burnett, probably as the like the wedding planner, and pro she's probably the best. Probably the best film work she ever did. Yeah, yeah, it's just and, a and lovely it's not film. one you think of very often no. with Carol Burnett. No, I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. And then, of course, you think about the the, the movies that are about this, the events surrounding the wedding. You think of The Hangover, the movie that yeah. introduced us to Bradley <laughs> Cooper, and a whole new kind of humor that we now get to see at the movies all the time. Yeah, yeah, and Bridesmaids is the flip side of that. I, I love Bridesmaids. Yeah, I just. That one, to me, is much more rewatchable than The Hangover is. I was just looking to see what was coming up this year, and of course we've got um, My Big Fat Greek Wedding 2. 2, that actually came and, yeah. came and went. It kind of came and went. It kind of disappeared. And there's another one called Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates, which sounds like it's going to go straight so, to the airplane um, repertoire. You know, then there's that whole collection of movies that I just can't stand, which this one sounds like. Or The Wedding Singer. I was never really big yeah. in, the, in The Wedding Singer. I was never really big on Honeymoon in Vegas, uh, where they kind of use it as a plot device without really exploring the mm -hmm. emotional dynamics. I think about um, you know, the wonderful wedding sequence at the end of The Graduate. Yeah, that's which has to be, you, you, you know, and that's a, a, a fabulous. Oh, this—that's the best image. The face, yes. The, the face, but you know that whole movie has been about the the fragility of relationships, and here they are at this wedding, and he, you know, is he going to get there in time, and all of this, and and then they they do what they do, and then they look at each other like, oh my goodness, what have we just done? Yeah which is really kind of sweet. Well, and that happens at a lot of wedding ceremonies, I think. You take yeah. that deep breath and you go, oh, stepping off the cliff here. S stepping off the cliff, but also realizing that, you know, whoever came up with the words for better or for worse probably had a good thought going. And, and that you, um, it, 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 you sometimes need to take the worst with the best. It, there's an old film, old film, and it's very difficult to find. It was based on a play called The Four Poster. And if you, if you search for it, sometimes it shows up like okay. on the fifth screen of an online streaming service. And it's the, the final recommendation I'd make because it's about a, a couple and they're 50 years together. And even though we only see the wedding briefly at the beginning, it does much of like what On Golden Pond does. To me, On Golden Pond is the ultimate film about marriage mm -hmm. because it shows that in the end, it doesn't, so many things don't matter. It's really what people matter to each other. And that's what weddings truly should be about. Well, and at some point we'll do another show on marriage, marriage. as opposed to weddings. Wow, we're really getting it. You know, without Steve, we can go some really interesting yeah. places. Well, thanks for coming in today, Thank you. Mark. It's and been a pleasure. And have a wonderful time on, on Saturday at, your, at this wedding. Yes, I will. Okay. Um, we're going to go to break now. And when we come back, we're going to have Catherine Michaels on. She's our etiquette columnist. And she's going to be giving us a, a few Bridezilla stories, which should be fun. It's time to come back to hometown banking, where people are taken into account, not just balances. Where community comes first. A place where there's more than one kind of interest. Where automation will never replace consideration. Where they not only know your name, they know your dog's name too. It's time to expect more. It's time to bank well. Bank smart. Bank local. Bank well. Walter Stewart's Market in New Canaan is your time-saving local shopping destination for the best of spring. Find many of your favorite products, from great specials on everyday items to the freshest organic produce, artisanal cheeses, and grass-fed steaks. Chop off your knives to be sharpened, grab a beautiful bouquet of spring flowers, and stop in next door for a wine tasting. Plus, their personable staff is always ready to lend a helping hand. So stop in to Walter Stewart's Market, 229 Elm Street, today, or shop online at stewartsmarket.com. Join the HAN Network and Make-A-Wish Connecticut to help make travel wishes come true for local kids with life-threatening medical conditions. Donate your unused airline miles to the HAN Network Wishes in Flight campaign. Over 70% of wishes granted involve travel, and your unused airline miles can help make kids' dreams become a reality. 
Plus, once you donate your miles to Make-A-Wish, they will never expire. Donate your unused miles and help the HAN Network share the power of a wish. What's happening up in Hartford and what's trending in the nutmeg state? Join Kate Chaplinski and Josh Fisher on CT Pulse Live Wednesdays at 12.30 to find out. We talk to the leaders and newsmakers while breaking down the stories you should be paying attention to each week. With the help of HAN's editorial cartoonist Doug Smith, we take a humorous look at the news of the week. We talk about everything you were told you should avoid bringing up in polite company. CT Pulse Wednesdays at 12.30 on the HAN Network. You are watching the HAN Network, and you're not alone. Nearly half a million viewers enjoyed our broadcasts in the first five months. Advertise on the network that reaches Fairfield County, Connecticut's most engaged audience. Contact Jessica Murren, Advertising Director, at 203-273-7312 or email jessica at han.network. Welcome back. This is Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. Um, in this segment, we're going to be talking about weddings again, and the uh, subject this time is going to be etiquette. We have Catherine Michaels with us. She's our uh, etiquette columnist for the Hearst and Maycorn Network, and um, she appears weekly in the arts and leisure section of all of our <coughs> papers. Um, <laughs> we're going to be talking about bridezillas, <laughs> which we hear a lot about. Um, they're the, the brides who take the wedding so seriously that they make everyone, everyone miserable. And they often do it for an entire year before the wedding, which is uh, quite, an, quite a feat. Um, we're going to start with a few questions. And, and one of the ones that uh, has come up in the past is, uh, and it's a great one, I'm a bridesmaid at a good friend's wedding. All the other bridesmaids are blonde, and I am a brunette. The bride has instructed me <laughs> to dye my hair blonde <laughs> so that everyone has the same look. This is not something I can do, nor do I intend to, and I'm a little shocked that she means it. So what should I say to her? You say, I'm really sorry, but <laughs> I can't do that. And if this is really important to you, then maybe you should choose someone else as your bridesmaid to give you the look that you want. And she may boot you right out of the wedding. <clears throat> she may be so furious that you've refused, she'll tell you not to come to the wedding at all. But in a perfect world, she'll realize that she's gone around the bend and you'll both laugh and that'll be it. It's Deep doubtful, breath. Yes. it's doubtful, but that could happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like the brides who say to their bridesmaids, this is the general idea of what I'd like you to wear. This is the color. Mm -hmm. Choose a dress that flatters you. Right. Yeah. Um, because our next question kind of gets into that. Um, another bridesmaid wrote that the bride had instructed all of her attendants to gain 20 pounds before the wedding so that the bride would look better. Mm -hmm. And she also emailed, and another also emailed wedding guests telling them the color scheme of the wedding so that they could dress appropriately so that they would be harmonious for the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> and then another one told us that the bride selected dresses for the attendants and the cost of them was $2,400 a dress, not counting shoes, of course, of course. and other accessories. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? <laughs> Well, I mean, what can you do? As a guest, you can say, oh, I think we'll skip this wedding because I don't really want to wear purple. Um, as a bridesmaid, you say, that's impossible, right? If for a $2,400 dress, that's insane. Yeah. You know, wedding gowns can cost less than half that to have the bridesmaids wear a dress they'll probably never wear again that costs that much money is Yes, crazy. which brings us back to wedding movies and the 27 dresses that Catherine Heigl wore. <laughs> right, right, the closet full. Yep. Okay, so here's another question. Um, I'm a maid of honor at my best friend's wedding. So far, she has found really expensive dresses and shoes for the bridal party to wear, which we all bought. And a few of us, including me, have airline tickets that we have to pay for, not to mention the cost of a hotel. And today, the bride asked me to call all the bridesmaids and tell them she would like each of us to give her $1,000 <laughs> as the wedding gift because, she said, she found the band that she really wanted was now available and she can't fit it into her budget. I can't do it. 
I'm not going to do it. And of course, I was going to give them a wedding gift, but it was nothing in the, in the <laughs> realm of $1,000, nor do I want to call all the bridesmaids and inform them of this. So where do we go from here? Um, you have to say to her, I am so sorry, but I cannot make that call. Nobody can afford to do that. Um, you know, you'll have to go back to, to plan B. Bride, bridezillas forget that their attendants are already giving up a lot to be in their wedding. Yeah. A lot. <clears throat> um, it costs money to do all those things. But by the way, the, the bride should be making the accommodations or paying for lodging for her attendants. Attendants ah. have to pay their own airplane ticket or train ticket or gas money if they drive or whatever. But the bride technically is supposed to cover their lodging because she's asking way a lot otherwise. Yeah, and in these days, are, are the parents of the bride the, the people expected to do that, or is that really on the bride and the groom? No, no, no. When I say the bride, I mean the bride's family. Yeah, okay. And for the groom's attendance, him or his family. Okay. That doesn't always happen, and it's not the end of the world if it doesn't, but it's nice if it can, because their attendants really are, are spending a lot of money on their behalf they are. already. Not to mention bachelor and bachelorette parties. Exactly. And, and those are often destination events mm -hmm. now, too. Okay, last, last letter, and this is a, this is a good one. I think we've, we may have talked about this before. Um, a bride-to-be emailed all of her bridesmaids, who all have jobs and some have families, telling them, not asking, that they should arrive two days early for the wedding because they needed to clean out the chapel that she'd selected for her ceremony. It hadn't been used in years, and she figured it would take all of them working together about two days to finish this. Now, first of all, What's going to happen to their fingernails, really? <laughs> They'll have to get them done again. Yeah? <laughs> that's, that's like one of the craziest questions we've, yes. we've, we've gotten and concerns. Because as I recall, that bridesmaid was very worried about this because she felt they should try to do it because mm -hmm. she'd do everything to support the bride. It's insane. And she has to say, they all, one of them has to say to the, to the bride, we can't we can't do that. If you can't afford to hire a professional cleaning company or that you can't find a professional cleaning company, then perhaps you should pick a different venue that has been cleaned <laughs> recently. <laughs> um, the other thing is that brides who have gone around the bend don't remember is that mostly their attendants have to take a vacation day or two. Mm -hmm. And when you only have two weeks vacation, and you're giving one or two of them up for your friend, the bride. That doesn't leave you a lot of vacation to go home and see your parents or go on a little trip or whatever else you want to do. So that's an extreme request. That is a bridezilla request. <laughs> and the answer is no. The answer <laughs> is no. Okay, well, thank you for these interesting <laughs> <laughs> situations. And we hope that no one encounters them in, in their own wedding and that everyone has a beautiful wedding this year. Um, we're going to take another break, and when we come back, we're going to have on Rob McWilliams, who writes Taking a Hike for um, our newspapers, and he's going to be talking about a new discovery he made this spring of a hiking trail in Connecticut. For over 25 years, Mike Sizzik Painting and Wallpapering has been the name to know for residential and commercial properties in Fairfield County. He uses only the top brands, including Benjamin Moore, for impeccable preparation and lasting quality. Call Mike now and receive $500 off any job over $7,000. Mike is currently accepting reservations for spring, so call him today at 203-770-8869 or 203 -770 972-3310. For your custom painting, finishing, and staining needs, it's Mike Sizik. At the Sylvan Learning Center of Darien, experienced teachers and personalized academic support equals superior results. Our certified teachers uncover skill gaps, address specific needs, and help students realize greater academic success and increased confidence. We're enrolling now. Individualized after-school tutoring and reading, math, history, elementary math, algebra, geometry, calculus, high school science, and study skills. For a free consultation, call 203-655-3276 or email gmcsylvan at gmail.com. 
had a sports injury or a slip and fall that needs immediate care, Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care gives you direct access to an orthopedic specialist fast without an appointment. Biking, golf, tennis, soccer, whatever the sports injury is, sprain or fracture, Coastal Ortho Express can help. Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care open Monday through Saturday in the I Park building at 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk or go to CoastalOrthoExpress.com. That's CoastalOrthoExpress.com. Like them on Facebook. I'm Kate Chaplinski. Join us for Coffee Break weekdays at 11 to get the latest Connecticut news, weather, high school sports, and more. News doesn't get any more local than on Coffee Break on the HAN Network. I'm Denise DiGregoli, the host of The Drive on the HAN Network. Join me Tuesdays for some motivational, intelligent talk with a little humor as we visit with people who live their lives mindfully. Tune in to The Drive live on Tuesdays, 1230, here on the HAN Network. Welcome back. I'm Sally Sanders. This is Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. Um, I have with me now Rob McWilliams, who is an avid hiker, as well as a blogger and a columnist. And he writes Taking a Hike, which appears on the Arts and Leisure page on, on the web. That's arts.hersomacorn.com. And he also has a, a blog spot that's at robmcwilliams.wordpress.com. Sounds right. Sounds right. Yep. And that, that one's called McWilliams Takes a Hike. That's right. Just to distinguish a little bit. Correct. Um, you've recently discovered a trail through Connecticut that, that sounds like a great one for people who, who would like to be fairly close to home in Fairfield County, but, but try something really different. Yeah, um, what, in Fairfield County, I think when we're looking for a hike that's um, a little more adventurous, we generally just head up Route 7. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's how you get to the Appalachian Trail, that's how you get to the Litchfield Hills. Um, this one's a little bit different in that you head into the center of the state, which we don't normally do to go hiking. We do that to go to Hartford or you know, up to Yukon or something. Um, I've known about this trail probably only for about a year. Um, which is a bit of a sad admission for someone who's lived here for seven years. And the name of the trail years. is the Metacomet? It's the Metacomet Trail. Now, to show you how badly I, I know it, I had a sudden moment of crisis a, a day or two ago and said, I wonder if I'm saying that right. <laughs> Could it be the Metacomet Trail? <laughs> so I actually went online and tried to find something on YouTube, and it does seem to be the Metacomet Trail. Um, yep, and it, it runs for 62 miles um, from the Massachusetts line down to the Hanging Hills of Meriden. Mm -hmm. um, and these days it's actually a section of the New, New England Trail, uh, which goes from Long Island Sound up to New Hampshire, mm -hmm. uh, 200 miles plus. Uh, and it follows this uh, geological uh, feature called the Metacomet Ridge. Uh, which also runs from the Massachusetts line down to the Sound. Um, a lot of people um, may not think they've been on the Metacomet Ridge, but you have been on part of it. Uh, if you've been, for example, onto West Rock Ridge in New Haven, okay, yeah, um, or the Sleeping Giant, they're all part of the Metacomet Ridge. Um, but the section that uh, my eldest daughter and I have set out to hike uh, this um, this spring. Um, and into the summer, I suspect. Um, it's called the Metacomet Trail, and it's the one that runs from Massachusetts down to Meriden, about now, 62 miles. Your daughter is Katie, and she lives in Hartford, so that makes it a little easier for navigating this. That, that's right. It, the circumstances actually came together rather nicely. Yes, my, my eldest daughter, Katie, works for the, the Hartford Current, if I'm allowed to say that. You may here. say that, yes. Um, I'm in, in Hartford, um, and she has a car and um, I have a car too, and really <laughs> this is a two-car trail, um, you know, that uh, it's not a backpacker's trail. There are no campsites, so you can't put your backpack on and, uh, and, and do the Metacomet Trail. Um, and if you did it in a series of sort of out and back day hikes, um, I think it would spoil the sort of sense of doing a relatively long distance mm -hmm. trail. Uh, so you, you know, park a car at one end, you drive up to the other end of the section of the trail you're doing, and, um, and off you go. And Katie and I have done that three times so far this year. We've covered about 30 miles. We're going out again tomorrow. 
Great. Um, and once we're done with the Metacomet Trail, the idea is to perhaps continue on down to the Sound and be able to say we've walked across the whole of Connecticut. So, that's it. it's uh, the the terrain of this is is can be challenging. It can be, although it's a very different experience, say, from the Appalachian Trail. Mm -hmm. The, the Metacomet Trail is definitely not a wilderness trail. You know, you're not out there in the deep woods. Um, you're in some, circuit, some parts, you're almost in a, well, you're in a suburban environment. Um, although there are definitely long sections that you'd call rural. Uh, Have they been prepared in any way, or is it just blazed? I mean, it, it, it's blazed, and it's generally a good trail. Uh -huh. um, we've come across very few sections that are particularly wet. Um, there are a few short, steep downs or ups, mm -hmm. um, but really nothing too challenging. For, so for someone who um, is really just looking for somewhere to hike, um, you know, without, um, you know, the... It's, you know, climbs that are too steep or anything that's too exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great place for that. Uh, the trail is good, the views are good, um, but as, a, as an idea, the highest points on the trail are about a thousand feet above sea level. That's you know, much, uh, much lower than the Appalachian Trail or, sure. or the Catskills or something. Yeah, I mean, like uh, Ridgefield, for example, is at 800, so we're... There you go. You know. It's not much, and, and those are the highest points. Mostly you are uh, three or four hundred feet above the surrounding countryside on this trap rock bridge. So you started in East Granby? We started or in Massachusetts? In, just inside Massachusetts mm -hmm. um, in Suffield um, and walked from Suffield down to East Granby mm -hmm. um, and then from there down to Bloomfield and Sim Sim Simsbury um, and then the next stop was just in Farmington and tomorrow we're hoping to walk from Farmington and ending up in Southington. And that's going to be, I think, the most suburban part of the trail so far. Uh, we'll, we'll have to cross 84, some other big highways, um, but hopefully with some very nice woods and hills in between. It's, it's a pretty part of the state that I think we in Fairfield County aren't as familiar with. I've done bicycling on the, on the Farmington River um, Valley Trail, which sort of parallels uh, the Metacomet, and uh, you get some nice runs in there that are that are very rural and and nobody around. There's some beautiful places, some beautiful communities. Um, I totally agree that here we tend not to go to that part of the state for outdoor activities. I, I think that's um, overlooking some very good hiking. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's actually pleasant to hike in a. Um, in, in a suburban environment and, it, and it's obviously very good that there are trails there that are close to where people live that they can use and benefit from um, so I'm it's, it's fortuitous for me that I've now got my daughter in Hartford yeah. I, I may not have done it otherwise um, but it's definitely something that I would recommend and we're enjoying it so would you say this was an appropriate trail for uh, a starting out hiker or should someone uh, do a little practicing in, in this vicinity first? I'd say it's an ideal tra trail for people that are starting out. Okay. Um, a lot of it, as I said, it's not too strenuous. A lot of it is also in state parks. Uh, you go through Penwood State Park, mm -hmm. which I particularly like. Uh, you go through um, uh, Tolcott Mountain State Park. I think mm -hmm. I've got the name right there where there's, there's a tower, yes? There is, which um, I've been busy calling Hoobland Tower. Um, but I did realize I was getting that one wrong. Hubline. It's Hybline, apparently. Hybline? According to Wikipedia, which oh, is always right. All right. So it's, it's of course, right. yeah, Wikipedia is always um, right. It's always right. Um, and so you, you're never far from civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not too grueling. There's a lot of stuff to keep, for example, kids interested. You know, the, there's towers, little ponds. You know, cliffs, you know, great cliffs that you can imagine. <laughs> yes, you know. those are not my favorite things. <laughs> oh, well, there are, there are those. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. You don't have to be an experienced hiker at all. Okay. Well, I'm going to bring up one more thing before we close this out, okay. which is um, wildlife. Uh, it, it seems, in, in at least in Ridgefield lately, we've had a spate of, of bear sightings, fox sightings, um, uh, bobcat sightings, coyote sightings. Have you ever encountered a bear or anything on the trails? 
I'm not on the Metacomet Trail, uh -huh. uh, and I don't know if bears live there. They certainly there was live a black nearby. bear just hit on eighty four in Southington. So yeah, they're they are there. they're there. And Simsbury and Buck Hampstead and these yeah, places oh, seem yes. to be the sort of bear capitals of of Connecticut. Uh, I have come across a bear on the trail on other trails several mm -hmm. times in the Catskills once um, out west um, up in. Uh, New Hampshire, and it's always been nothing but a very pleasant experience. He goes by, you wait. I see the bear, I shout, it scuttles off, um, and it's never been any other way. So Yeah, they, the only time I've seen a bear on a trail was in, in Quebec, and same thing, they just... Do you have to shout at we them in were, French up there? Uh, <laughs> Allez! Hmm? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it was a little bear, and he was just running across the trail. I don't think he even noticed us. We were on yeah. bikes. but it, It's always such a great experience. It is. They're yeah. so beautiful, and that's, that's the thing I hope people appreciate if they do see one rather than panic and don't throw food to them. Definitely not. Yeah. Um, I put up a little trail camera in my backyard mm -hmm. uh, talking about the variety of wildlife, and uh, we, we're picking up... Uh, um, well, I have picked up a bobcat, but we're getting a lot of coyotes and foxes and raccoons, yeah. of course, opossums. And we've got an, an owl right now that is just hanging in our trees in broad daylight, just jumping onto chipmunks when they come out. Well, serves them right. Yeah. Serves them right. That's what I think. I'm Thank you, Rob, for coming in. You're it's very been welcome. lots of fun. Uh, we're going to close it out here for Arts and Leisure on HAN Network, and we'll be back next week. Uh, Steve Coulter will return, and uh, we'll be talking movies and. Lots of other things. Thank you.